much. So welcome everyone uh, to this research demo. Um, it's about model learning for evolving and variability intensive systems, and I've organized it in four sections, each taking about three to four minutes. So in total, I, I, I intend to spend about 15 minutes on the presentation, and I'm looking forward to a lively discussion with all of you. So the first bit is about, is about uh, trust in autonomous systems. That's our research ethos, and everything that we do in our group is around that theme. Uh, then uh, connected to trust in autonomous systems, I will introduce you to the basics of active learning very briefly. So I'm not going to actually do any live demo of software or um, go into mathematics of what we are doing, but I will show you the results of applying the software and uh, link to papers where we can, you can read more about uh, the mathematics. So uh, it will be a little bit superficial, but uh, hopefully enough to trigger a lot of discussion. So I will introduce you to the basics of active learning, which is the basic field where we are um, where we are um, doing research um, about this topic, and then we will uh, discuss two types of evolution that are relevant to to the subject of today's um, uh, demo. The first one is about learning uh, about evolution in time and how to learn about evolution in time, and the second one is about evolution in space, meaning the different features that you implement in, into your system. So, uh, as I said, our main um, ethos is trust in autonomous systems, and our idea is to apply rigorous analysis techniques, um, formal techniques, mathematical techniques, to ensure safety and trust in autonomous systems. What do we mean by trust? Trust is an epistemic state of the user, uh, which means that the user um, thinks that the system is going to be helpful and is not going to harm uh, him or herself um, in very difficult, uncertain, uh, challenging scenarios. Uh, the, people have been researching trust uh, quite a bit, uh, initially in terms of human-human and social interactions, but also later on in terms of human-machine interaction, um, and they have come up with a list of contributors. The main one that I will be focusing today is technical transparency, is, is having a, an understandable model of how the system behaves and uh, revealing the intention of the designers, which is often missing in, in modern complex systems. So if, if you look at uh, AI-enabled systems, if you look at uh, lots of different autonomous systems around us, we have no idea what design intentions have been implemented into them. And th this, this talk is an attempt to reveal that design intention by building models automatically. So how do we build models? So I've, I've covered our ethos in less than three minutes, I hope, and um, I will uh, move into uh, model learning, which is one means uh, for achieving technical transparency. Suppose you are given a very complex system as a black box. Many of the systems you are dealing with are given as a black box. Uh, even if you are um, a system integrator, often you are using off-the-shelf components that are black boxes. How can we reveal the intentions of the designers, the, 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 the way these systems were built, by automatically learning models from them? Uh, so let me start with the hammer I often use in my research. I, my, my main area of research is model-based testing, and model-based testing, typically people start with some sort of test model, a specification model, that using an engine will be turned into a test suite. Of course, that engine may take more inputs than just the test model. For example, you may have a test goal or a test purpose as an input to your um, to your test case generation um, engine, and that will spit out a test suite that will be run uh, against um, an implementation, and then there will be a, a verdict about the conformance of the implementation, the black box implementation, with respect to the test model that you specified in advance. And that is typically characterized by some sort of mathematical model as well, which I will not talk about uh, in today's um, in today's talk. That will be a separate talk. Uh, now, the problem is often when you go to um, to industry and ask them, um, could we collaborate on applying model based testing or any other model? based or even even further model driven technique, they would ask you, well, what model are you talking about? <laughs> so typically um, many industries do not have models at all, or, or if they had any models, the models were quite outdated and then they were used in, in initial stages of the design and they're forgotten about for, for a very long time. So uh, the present research enables model-based testing when there are no models around, 
by learning models, for example, from reference implementations, from uh, different um, types of implementations that are around, and they will enable um, they will enable lots of model based and model driven techniques when the models are outdated or are not available. Now, how do, how does um, our proposed technique work? Typically. Uh, so you, you you need a specification model to model based testing, but you could start with with a very simple or even an empty specification model, uh, which which says everything is possible. So you only know what kind of input output behavior is possible with your system. Uh, start with this very naive. Uh, basically empty specification and then generate some test cases to test your empty hypothesis test whether what you know about the system which is initially empty is correct or not you will run a few test cases you will run a few queries to your system and the outcome of that will be fed into a, an automatic engine that will construct a new hypothesis for you right and you, you will continue this loop uh, as many times as needed until you have sufficient confidence that what you have learned as the model of the implementation is um, is a good model, is a, is a representative model, is a conforming model to what is inside that black box. So that is our idea of model learning. And it goes back to many, many years ago, uh, a few decades ago at least, but even beyond that. And one of the key uh, contributors, one, one of the say some uh, seminal papers that that kind of shaped this field was was by Dana Anglin, who, who is still a researcher in this field. She is at, um, I think, Yale University in the US. And she wrote this paper, Lear Re Learning Regular Sets from Queries and Counterexamples. And then she defined some sort of paradigm for model learning, which we are using, of course, with lots of different tweaks and, and, and um, bells and whistles these days. How does Dana Anglin's uh, framework look like, paradigm look like? Um, she thinks of a learning algorithm as something that uh, is interacting actively with something called a teacher. And a teacher is something that has the black box inside it, right? But it also has a little bit of intelligence in addition to the black box. Let's see how that intelligence works. So typically you start with with very simple uh, hypothesis, that, which says a, everything is possible in this black box. So you could press all those different buttons. You could get all those different outputs. And those are typically um, uh, posed as things called output queries or membership query. So you ask, is it possible to apply this output to this input? And then you you observe that some output from your system uh, by asking these type of questions from your teacher. The teacher in this case will basically let you ask the questions directly to the system on the learning because the system is capable of receiving inputs and producing outputs, right? So those are typically very simple types of queries that uh, let you learn a little bit about uh, the behavior of the system. Once you learn uh, a little bit about the behavior of the system, you will refine your hypothesis, so you will have a better idea what kind of input output behavior is possible, and you will pose them to the teacher as a hypothesis. You say, I think what is inside the black box is this type of behavior. Is that a correct model or not? And then because there is some intelligence in the teacher, namely there is a model-based testing tool in the teacher sometimes, um, it will take your hypothesis, run many, many tests with the system under learning, and then either refute your hypothesis, hypothesis by giving you back a counterexample, saying that no, your hypothesis is incorrect, and here is a behavior that is not possible in your model, but possible in your system under learning, or vice versa, right? Or you say, well, as far as I can see, your model is a perfect model of the system under learning, and then you, you, you end your session with the teacher, right? So that's the concept of active learning. You start with very simple queries called membership or output queries, right? Which go directly to the system under learning. And every now and then, when you have sufficient confidence, which are mathematically defined, very, very precisely defined in terms of some conditions, uh, you will pose some queries to the teacher that are that will translate into a large number of queries that will test your hypothesis and either give you a counterexample or give you assurance that what you have learned is correct, right? So this is the, the general framework where we develop our research about model learning. Now, um, 
we we developed th this idea in in very different directions and two directions that I will be talking about is about evolving systems that change in time and evolving systems that change in space meaning that they have various different types of features that could be added or removed or or modified in the system so let's talk about evolution in time and indeed this is joint work with Diego who is uh, here and you could ask all the difficult questions to him he is a postdoc now at um, Radboud University in, in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and uh, Danielso Simao, who is a very good colleague at the University, the University of Sao Paulo in, in, in Brazil. So what is the idea of uh, learning about evolving systems? Suppose some time ago, say a few years ago, you learned a behavior of a SIN system. Here is a very sim simple um, uh, automotive system that that uh, we use as a running example in our, in our paper, right? And after some time, the system has evolved. So there was there were bug fixes, there were things that were added or removed, and you have a new black. Oh, sorry, you have a new black box that has different behavior, and you would like to start with your old model and and find out what parts of the model are still valid and what part of the model have changed through through time, right? And we asked to we, we develop an algorithm that I'm not going to present today. The algorithm basically tries to reuse as much information from your old models and find out very quickly what parts of the model are not any more valid and, and start only exploring those parts than, than, than exploring the behavior of the system. And, and after de having developed that algorithm, by the way, these are two other pieces of research that we build upon that I'm not going to talk about. They, they propose other algorithms that are um, that were the basis for our extension for, for our algorithm uh, that we proposed a couple of years ago. And we ask these two different different questions. One is, can we learn a, an evolving system efficiently without basically reposing all those all, all those queries that that were still valid to the evolved system? And secondly, is our algorithm robust enough so that if you uh, if you learn a system after some time, you 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 spend a reasonable amount of ex extra effort to to relearn the system. So, in, in other words, is their learning effort uh, linearly increasing with, for example, evolution in time? So these are the two questions we asked, and we applied it to about 120 different versions of, uh, if I remember well, OpenSSL as as one case study, and uh, we asked those questions by running our, our algorithm towards. Uh, on, on all those um, versions of OpenSSL. And here is a, a glimpse of our results. So first of all, we have seen that um, the number of uh, queries that we pose to the system are much smaller. And, and if, if but, but I, should, I should give you an interpretation of this picture. If the number that you see, the mean of, of, of the box plot that you see is, is below zero, it means that you are spending far less number of queries to the system than, than, than a naive algorithm that would, would repose all those queries to, 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 um, to the system, right? So you're saving effort if your mean is below zero. And you see that if, if you look at 10 years or, or more, if maybe 15 years of evolution of, of OpenSSL, um, the amount of effort we spent on model learning, starting from a, from a, a simple version, does not increase too much, and it's in all cases the mean is below zero. So we are at in the worst case we are as bad as uh, relearning the, the 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 system from scratch. And the second thing we we asked is how how robust our algorithm is with respect to the evolution of the system. And you see that the algorithm uh, follows uh, some sort of linear. Um, uh, increase, maybe even sublinear in, 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 in interpretation with respect to the evolution of the system in time. So that was the result that we published in this paper. And I should wrap up quickly. The second thing that we did, and that's a, a line of research that we have been developing recently quite a bit, was to look at the change of the system in terms of different configurations, different types of features. So suppose you have learned a basic version of the system, and now after some time new features have been added, uh, some features have been removed, some features have been modified. How can I learn um, a 150% model of the system that kind of summarizes all those changes that are possible, all those different configurations that are possible in the system? And again, uh, we have developed an algorithm that I don't have time to talk about, but we, are, we have asked two main questions about that algorithm. First of all, can we build a succinct model that summarizes all those possible configurations, possible changes in the system? And 
can I do that efficiently by learning very few samples of, of all those many, many different configurations that are possible? And we have applied it uh, to, um, to different types of benchmark systems. First of all, we compared the size of the system with, with the sum of the sizes of, size of the different configurations. And in all cases, the uh, mean of the size of the system we learn is much smaller than the mean of the, um, the original system um, the, the original configurations that we started with. So if we could basically squeeze the learn model into a model that is much smaller, much more understandable than the sum of the models that we started learning from. So that was one question and the effect size is quite large. And secondly, we looked at um, the sample size and how the sample size could, uh, could uh, influence the uh, the conciseness and also the, the precision of our algorithm. So let me look at this one. And what we showed there that is that in most cases, in almost all cases, with, with some exceptions, ha covering the product um, configuration by just pa taking pairs of samples, covering pairs of features, is enough to get about 100% precision out of the model learning technique. So there are, ex there are exceptions. For example, in this case, some it does pay off to go uh, to a three-wise sampling of the of the features, but even in this case, if you look at the mean, the mean is very close to 100%. So, in most cases, and also in this case, you see there there is some improvement if you go from two uh, from pairwise to three-wise uh, and onwards. But the the added value is typically very very small. So with very few samples, uh, you could add, gain gain uh, um, uh, very high precision. Uh, by looking at the different configurations of, of the system. So that summarizes uh, my uh, talk, and uh, I would be very happy to take your further questions. Thank you very much.